May I now request Anina and Anisha, our esteemed guests, to come and give our even more esteemed guests the flowers. Anina is giving to Professor Banerjee. Now, Ani Anisha is going to give it to Justice Hima Kohli. <laughs> Anina will give it to Justice Mridul. Justice, Anina and Anisha to Justice Lokul. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my absolute pleasure to invite, uh, to welcome all of you in the audience, our chief guest, Justice Hema Kohli, and Justice Siddharth Mridul, who will be presiding over today's lecture to the 27th Justice Ananda Bhandare Memorial Lecture. This lecture is our way of commemorating the life and legacy left behind by my grandmother, who would have turned, th uh, would have turned 80 on November 1st. Throughout her life, she worked for gender justice and the upliftment of marginalized societies. She strongly believed that a country's worth should be measured by the degree of freedoms enjoyed by its women. And this foundation was established with that vision to fulfill. As we emerged from COVID, the foundation this past year 
was also able to pick up on some of its activities. In February, we held a legal awareness program for over 100 women that also focused on skill development, on skills such as tailoring and computers. Later in April, we held a camp with a special focus on legal rights along with the Guild for Service. As we celebrate the life and legacy of my grandmother, it would be remiss for us to not also celebrate the legacy left behind by Ila Ben Bhatt, who passed away only three days ago. We were honored by her grace and wisdom when she deliver, delivered the 11th Justice Sunanda Bhandare Memorial Lecture in 2005. We remember her for her tireless efforts for gender justice through her various organizations, including SEVA. Ila Ben was an inspiration, not just to women in the organized and, and unorganized labor force, not just to women in self-employment, not just to women in microfinance, but to men and women in India and abroad. To honor her memory and work, I would request everyone in the audience to maintain a minute of silence. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you this year's speaker, who, as cliche as it sounds, needs no introduction at all. Nobel laureate Abhijit Banerjee received the prize for economics in 2019, along with Esther Duffalo and Michael Kramer, for their work in poverty alleviation. He argued that poverty reduction and economic development through open government through open government and education were the key to democracy, as it provides people full access to society's resources and makes them active participants in various societal activities. While we wait to hear his remarks on democracy, I would like to first invite Justice Hema Kohli, the first woman Chief Justice of Telangana High Court, and at present, one of four women judges to sit on the Supreme Court to deliver her address. Thank you. A very good evening, <clears throat> Professor Abhijit Banerjee, Justice Lokur, Justice Siddharth Mridul, Mr. Murli Bhandari, family members of Justice Ananda Bhandari, <clears throat> distinguished guests, Friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. I'll start by correcting my friend. We are now three and not four in the Supreme Court, hoping to get stronger sooner. But presently, three, Justice Banerjee having retired very recently. We have assembled this evening to attend the 27th Justice Sunanda Bandare Memorial Lecture being delivered by Professor Banerjee. We look forward to hearing him articulate the views on an interesting subject. On my part, I propose to share with you how serendipity had a role to play in my life when it came to Justice Bandari. Having completed the law course from Campus Law Center, Delhi University in the year 1984, when no one within the family or my extended family or my family friends in the, were in the legal profession it was a daunting task for me to get a placement in a chamber to embark upon my career as a litigation lawyer. It was a matter of chance that a family friend suggested that Justice Bhandari, who was then an advocate on record, practicing mainly in the Supreme Court, would be an ideal person under whom I could learn the ropes. Blissfully unaware of the fact that her name was under active consideration for appointment as a judge of the Delhi High Court, I made efforts to seek an appointment with her. 
before any appointment <clears throat> could materialize, she was elevated as an additional judge of the Delhi High Court on 1st of June, 84. By the time my results were declared, the month of July was over. In August, I suffered a sprain in my leg due to which I was grounded for a month. I could get enrolled with the Bar Council only in September. In the meantime, our family friend conveyed that Mr. Murli Bhandare, a senior advocate in the Supreme Court, would be willing to take me under his wings since his wife was no longer available to do that. So an appointment was fixed for me in his South Extension uh, home office. And uh, having never faced an interview before that as a student, I was overwhelmed with anxiety. Seeing my nervous state, my parents decided to accompany me to his residence on the scheduled date to have to interact. And on hindsight, I can understand the surprise on his face on seeing a whole brood trot in, in his office instead of just the interviewee. After several years of practice and associating young lawyers as juniors in my office, I can still imagine <clears throat> what his <clears throat> reaction must have been. <clears throat> he must have wondered if he was conducting the interview or was being interviewed. But Mr. Bhandari was gracious enough to go through the formalities and suggest that before deciding which way I go, I could join his office and get the feel of how both the Supreme Court and the High Court function as he used to appear in both the courts at that time. And that's how I joined the chambers of Mr. Bhandari. Sometime in September, 84, it was also a matter of chance that his chamber in the Supreme Court was number 84. <laughs> Mr. Bhandari had a busy practice. I remember following him from court to court for that little period that I was associated with him, watching many matters being conducted and generally getting a hang of the completely new environment that was thrown at me with not a soul known in the Supreme Court. Most of my friends were in the High Court. His junior colleague, Ms. Sucharita, made life comfortable for me by hand-holding me, which I was, and I'm still thankful for. Within one month of my joining Mr. Bandare's chamber, I realized that as a novice, it would be better for me to work with a lawyer in the Delhi High Court that boasts of an original side and would therefore throw up more opportunities for me to appear in my own right as compared to the Supreme Court. So while finding a place for myself under the sun in the Supreme Court, contemporaneously, Mrs. Bhandari was getting familiar with the new routine of a judge in the Delhi High Court. A request was made to her to look for a placement for me yet again in the Delhi High Court. And she did. It was on her recommendation that I knocked at the doors of Mr. Y.K. Sabarwal, who went on to become the Chief Justice of India. At that time, he was a standing counsel for the Delhi administration in the High Court, and also the president of the Delhi High Court Bar Association. Besides a robust private practice on the civil side, he was, he was on a panel of several government authorities, which was ideal for a newcomer like me, who could get an opportunity to learn drafting, and to start with, get to appear in some minor matters before the registrar and the joint registrars. Wiser from the past experience, this time I went alone for being interviewed by him at his chamber in the Delhi High Court, while my family waited patiently for me in the car down below in the parking. After a brief <clears throat> positive interaction, I was packed off with his junior colleague to familiarize myself and the <clears throat> court where and how it was functioning. Again, there was a lull in my career as within a couple of days of my joining the chambers of Mr. Sabarwal, the then Prime Minister, Mrs. Gandhi, was assassinated in October 1984. Due to the riots that broke in the capital and other parts of the country, my senior advised me to stay at home till things normalized. By the time I rejoined work, it was almost the middle of December and we were ready to break for the winter vacations. So, strictly speaking, my career took off sometime in January 85. So just to complete the story, I was still a greenhorn when Mr. Sabarwal was elevated to the bench in November 85. Armed with his recommendations, I joined the chambers of Mr. Vijayendra Jain, with whom I was associated till he got elevated to the bench in 92. <laughs> During my years <clears throat> as a young practitioner, I remember having appeared with my senior and later in my own right, thank you, 
before Justice Bhandari. At that time, there were just a couple of women judges in our court. Even the number of women practitioners were limited. It was awe-inspiring to watch the speed with which she would take up matters and deal with them with dispatch. Although she was not an original side practitioner, when she did preside on the original side of the Delhi High Court, it was with complete ease that she handled complicated civil matters. She was known as a relief-giving judge, had a pleasant demeanor, was kind and encouraging to the junior members of the bar, but at the same time firm when it came to work. Her tenure as a judge of the High Court was for a decade from 85 to 94, when she passed on at the prime age of 52 years in November 94. Had she continued to serve as a judge, there was a very bright chance of seeing her adorn the Supreme Court as the first Chief Justice of the country. Outside the court, Justice Bhandari carried her mantle of a judge very lightly. I understand that she devoted time at home attending to needs of her family and the household chores with equal enthusiasm. I'm told that sometimes she would rush straight from court to attend an Ikebana exhibition to improve her flower decoration skills. This rings a bell with me too. My sister Nilu had learned Ikebana and has been practicing it during her tenure as a guest teacher at Modern School Barakamba Road, where she taught flower arrangement, she organized an annual flower show where the students would participate regularly. And I remember, not just as a lawyer, but as a judge too, accompanying her in the wee hours as her assistant with a segatus in my hand and her students scurrying all around her, with some of them deflected towards me by default due to sheer lack of time to help them get their act together. This continued till well early, let's say 2013 or 14, at least till a dec decade ago, and was really a stress buster. On elevation, when my family and I moved to an official accommodation, we selected a bungalow on Zakir Hussain Road, which is still my abode as of now, and it was nothing less than serendipity that the lane that leads to that bungalow was named after none other than Justice Sunanda Bhandari. I have continued to reside there all these years, and each time the car turns into the lane, I fondly remember her. Most of the judges in the High Court who walk in the corridors of the old block where the Chief Justice's court is, see the painting of Justice Bhandari displayed on the second floor her presence in the High Court is still as alive as it was when she was there in body. In fact, that painting is quite close to what you have seen just now displayed here on the dais, except the emblem at the back of the chair. In her tenure of a decade as a judge of the High Court, she had delivered some landmark judgments, one of the last ones being against the old Army Act that permitted personnel to be dismissed without assigning any reason. I understand that she authored this judgment for the full bench when she was still in pain and it was delivered two days before she had to leave India for her treatment in England. She did not live to see the, that the judgment was upheld by the Supreme Court. Justice Bhandari remains etched in my memory as a warm-hearted human being and a brilliant judge. She was a fourth generation lawyer very few would know that she joined the law college when she was, she had already got married. She had enrolled herself with the Maharashtra Bar Council when she was a mother of two. It was her determination to make a mark that made her build a formidable reputation for herself as a lawyer and later on as a judge. She lived by the belief that a woman has to excel for her to be regarded as equal to a man. Justice Bhandari was a trailblazer. I find resonance in what Germany Kent, an American journalist, had to say, and I quote, you don't know the background story of resilience, struggles and strength of beautiful and outgoing women. All you see is what is showcased. My endeavor today was not just to give the audience a flavor of what went into making that strong and resilient woman, Justice Bhandari, but to give a shout out to all those women out there who aspire 
to navigate their career crafts and become trailblazers like her. Just as she has been an inspiration for me and many others like me who were at the threshold of our careers at that point in time, I hope that we can continue celebrating the success stories of women on platforms like this one, as I believe that we derive strength when we cheer and we stand by other women on the same journey. Thank you. May I now, may I now request Professor Banerjee to deliver the 27th Justice Sunanda Bhandari Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much for having me deliver the 27th Justice Sunanda Bandare lecture. I, I didn't have the fortune to meet her, but she seems to have been an extraordinary woman. I'm also touched by the memory of someone who I knew well, um, um, Ila, Ila Ben Bhatt who also passed away the uh, last few days, and I'm very glad that we remembered her. It's, uh, it's also, I, I, it's, it's a bit humbling to be uh, giving this lecture, given the, both the extraordinary list of people who have given past lectures and the, uh, the, the audience here. And uh, I, w I want to express especially my gratitude to the to uh, Justice Bhandari's family, and in particular to um, Mr. Murli Bhandari, who took the trouble to I invite me, despite my rather inattentive e email responses. Um, thank you very much. Um, I so th I um, I thought about what I would what I would speak about, and uh, and. Um, one, co one can always, um, I mean, there is always a kind of a compulsion to uh, try to say, s I don't know if one can, uh, I would like the, uh, I think I, it was there, uh, okay, good, excellent, excellent, um, thank you. Um, and uh, I think I, to disappoint, uh, let me start by, setting a low bar. That way I won't disappoint any of you. So I want to start by saying what I'm not going to talk about. And that's a, a much of, I, I suspect many of you might have come here just to, uh, on Kalia. <laughs> so I can say what's on that slide, which is, um, but I can't say what's on the next slides because then even numbers on it. Um, it's hard. I think I think it's better if I do it. Um, so. I, Actually, going to, I would like to see the slides, and this, and the angle is not great. Okay, uh, I'll try. Uh, so I think let me start by saying what I'm not going to say. So there are lots of things to be said about democracy in India. Many of them are, and uh, given that I spend my time, uh, you know, working with, uh, you know, whatever data I can gather. They're in a sense beyond my competence. There's there's a lot to be said about our is indeed there are people who speculate about whether there is democracy in India or purely majoritarianism. 
that's that and many other debates about whether our de democracy at the federal level or at the state levels is in good shape or bad, I will have nothing to say about. So those of you who are disappointed can leave now. I, I do want to speak about something that is, I think, extremely important for, I think, the functioning of our, our democracy as a way of serving its people, which is what is it, what, are, what can we say about the mechanisms on the ground what kind of pressures do legislators face? Do they respond to the pressures? Why, why are there, uh, why isn't there more pressure on them? And therefore, why don't they deliver more? So that, that question is, is, is a, it's not the most ambitious question one could answer, but, it's, it, but I have spent an entire career trying to defend myself of the charge of not being ambitious enough, so I'll continue to do that. I'm, I'm going to be resolutely unambitious and answer a question I can say something about. So I will sh I'll be able to show you some data on questions that, I, that I've taken on to answer. There are other questions that I think are perfectly interesting and indeed I, I suspect many of you would like to know about, uh, which, on which I have nothing I have no data to show, so I'm going to essentially take what in America, America is called the fifth. Um, okay, let me start. This is not brilliant. Doesn't seem to be working very well for me. Okay, uh, le let's see if I can. No, I I I would like to able to. Yeah, it's working fine now. Let me just. Okay, great. It's working better. Uh, yes. If you do, that would be a big help. In fact, uh, I think uh, Justin Lobo is going to suggest that yeah. we should have yeah, the meeting today. Yeah. They also are not working, so it's not convenient. Yeah. This is the best one. Yeah. 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 I'll just take it again. Yeah. No, this is fine. This is in This is fine. Put it, put it again. No, he'll, he'll it still needs. No, no, no. This way. See? I think this okay. is, that would be great. Would you be okay. able to see? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I have. A, so, let me say what what I think is relatively. Um, I mean, when you there is a very very many ways in one can evaluate a democracy, and I think in the end, it's always easy to say, well, we should deepen our democracy. And, those, and maybe we, we should. But I think the, in the very superficial uh, uh, markers of successful democracy, we do pretty well. We have very competitive elections, high levels of participation, people vote. Uh, they, there is turnover. We, we do, do at, at least at the, uh, at the constituency level, there's actually fairly strong anti-incumbency in many, many states. So uh, winners don't necessarily uh, win again. So we, we have, so if you look at the numbers, we have actually a surprisingly um, sort of, if you take the standard markers of democracy, are people voting? Are people uh, voting people out? We do see high levels of those things. So we're not, uh, in, in, the, in the very obvious ways um, or democracy is measured, we do pretty well. And I, I think it's very clear that elections are, very, are competitive and are perceived as competitive. Winners don't uh, take it easy. You, you have, at least at election times, people are extremely energi energized. Uh, people, uh, you know, all the leaders of all the parties, uh, you know, travel, travel to the wherever the election is. Right now, everybody's in Gujarat. They will, uh, no doubt, move to to Himachal soon. So it's it's it, it, people are 
people, uh, the leaders perceive these leaders, uh, elections are competitive. They, the, the legislators compete for votes. Uh, to, to whatever ex extent we, uh, we can see, there is also um, sort of people parading their record, saying things that seem to, should matter to voters, making claims about success and failure. So all the trappings of democracy at least are there. And I, I don't want to say that negatively. I don't want to say that that means there is nothing deeper. I just want to say that if you look at the standard ways of measuring uh, democracy on the ground, you see lots of it. I think that's, that, that I think is worth saying. The next thing is worth saying is that, the, you know, in terms of many of the markers of state delivery, we do pretty badly. And in a, you know, if you just look at, I mean, I give you some very well-known facts. Um, one is in education, where the state is, invests a huge amount of money. We, we actually spend something like 5% of GDP on education. Um, you see two facts. One is exit from the government system, systematically. You know, you see the proportion of people, uh, children going to private schools going up year after year. And you see, when you, and you, when you look at, the, uh, at Asar, the, uh, the report that Pratham bring, brings out every year, uh, you see that you know, the, the average uh, child in, the median child in class five is about at the second grade level. So it's, it's and that's, and that's not got better. It's, that's, that seems to be about what it was, maybe a little worse than it was when uh, the ASA started about uh, you know, 15 years ago. So it, w it hasn't got better. And um, you know, one could talk, of, talk about you know, other social programs and whether the people, we, for example, uh, many states have a pension program. I know this because it's one of the programs I've studied. And very few people get that pension. Uh, yeah, among the people who are meant to be entitled to it. So th th there is a lot of, of obvious failure in delivery. And so those, so let me start by sort of counterpointing those two things. At least at the kind of the maybe superficial but normal measures of democratic uh, participation and competition, we do very well and we, but, and yet a state that is, you know, run by people who are com participating in competitive elections, the theory is that competitive elections will make, put the pressure on them to deliver. We don't see hugely high levels of delivery. And I'll, I'll, come, I'll, I'll show you much more detailed numbers on that. But that, those two facts are, uh, I think, a ve very good starting point for any conversation on, on democracy here. Now, there's, I think, three uh, forms of failure. One is implementation. Uh, and, but I, I, I don't want to treat that necessarily as um, a separate object. I mean, clearly, some, some cases, um, you know, you, you have very much, uh, you know, uh, bureaucratic hurdles, uh, you know, corruption at, at the ground level, all kinds of things which are primarily about, you know, you can, there's only so much that the political system can do. There is some implementation that has to be done on the ground, and there are failures there. But, uh, but I think, for example, uh, but I, I, I want to argue that that's not uh, that, that's a significant part of the story, but it's not all of the story. And I'll try to argue that in a minute. But uh, and, and there are two other forms of failure. One is, I think, failure by design, meaning what I am calling a failure is, in some ways, not a failure. Um, I, I should. I, I skipped uh, what I, uh, an example that I had, which I, but I'm going to come back to the, that in a minute, um, and sort of try to give you examples of what I mean by fa failure by design. And then there is democratic failure, meaning somehow this the the competition that we see doesn't translate into incentives to perform. That's what I would call democratic failure. That there is a sense in which. You, the idea that competition will generate people, you know, taking actions that are in the interests of the voters to win, 
that mechanism doesn't work as well as it should. So there the are two pieces to it. Let me get the first one out of the way, and then I'll, I'll and uh, and then I'll spend the most of my time talking about democratic failure. So one of one of them that I, I think is um, is I think very very much. Uh, The, you know, I, I think one, one one can, you know, there's there's clear that there is a trade-off, for example, between, you know, em, em, sort of empowering local democracy, uh, giving power to the panchayats, giving them money to spend, giving them cho choices to make, and maybe in some cases the the uh, there there is either not not the competence to do what they what they're expected to do, or even, even just the, uh, at, at some level, maybe even just the incentives. So one of the, and one of the reasons why there is, there is possibly uh, less incentives is that uh, there is, uh, for example, a very large fraction in, in panchayat elections uh, of the incumbents cannot run the next time. And that's a number that depends, varies across states, but it can be as high as 50%. So uh, because of the rotation of seats between different forms of reservation, uh, so a lot of people are, are term limited out. They can't run the next time. So you could imagine that that, now is that, the, uh, what I mean by failure by design is that I still think lo local democracy is a good thing. Even though it's not always the case that the people doing the job are, have the competence, I think local democracy is essential in getting pe giving people a sense that their choices are di directly affecting the outcomes at an Im immediacy that uh, you can't get through any other system. Uh, I, I think so, I think democ local democracy is valuable. It may be, we, we get failure, uh, but that's failure by design. We want local democracy e even when that doesn't work perfectly. And likewise, I think, we want reservations. I think reservations, uh, there's, I think, very compelling evidence that reservations both for, uh, for you know, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, and women have uh, salutary effects on many outcomes. Uh, and uh, w people who have, this, this is work that, you know, my wife Esther Duflo has done, my one, uh, several of my students have done, and I think uh, the work shows very much using precisely the fact that a lot of these reservations are implemented at random. There are actually lotteries uh, implementing it. You can compare the places which got the reservation or not, and don't. You, and I think while there are often claims of, you know, somehow this will lead to massive uh, incompetence, you see no evidence of it. Women, uh, when women, women, and you see as a result over a period of time, independent women legislators emerging as a result of that. You see that once people are exposed to women legislators, they're more li willing to vote for them. So the, there, are, there is a, a fair amount of, there are many tensions in the design of democracy. The point I'm trying to make here is simply that, you know, you, you try to, there's good reason to have reservations, but those, then they bite you back in other ways. Because once you have reservations, then you can't, have, because you rotate the res reservations, the incumbents cannot have un, un, open terms. They will be term limited out. So you have a tension between uh, the uh, a commitment to reservations and a commitment to letting people who, who are performing well continue. So I, I think those tensions are built into the nature of democracy. So I want to say that some of our failure comes from the design, by design, that we, we actually intend uh, we, we, there are trade-offs, we made choices, I, I support those choices. But that, that's, I think, uh, that's, I think, uh, one part of the story. Uh, the part of the story I want to, uh, so another one, and I, I think there's also another piece of it which I want to get out of the way, which is that I, I think in many cases what I think the state should be delivering is not what the voter think it should be delivering. For example, um, when you ask parents what uh, they want from the education system, they want their, their children to qualify for government jobs. Now, turns out that that's a very, very unlikely outcome of the system. Most people won't get government jobs. There's just not many government jobs. You have these examples of, you know, 60, 
jobs, 90,000 people lining up for them. You know, th these are not, these are, there are many instances of that. There is not enough jobs. So, but when you ask parents, they often say that we want our children to get education because it's going to get them a government job. But that, that changes their attitude to when you tell them that no, uh, what education we should really do is teach people some basic skills. And, and you don't see the enthusiasm I would have uh, expected. I, uh, when I start do it, doing this and making that argument, I would get the response that no, but that's not what I want. I want my child to uh, succeed. And if he doesn't get a government job, then there's no point in getting educated. Whereas in fact, of course, for most, uh, probably most of in this, in this room, most people agree that the point of education is precisely to be educated, not to get a government job. So in some sense, there are, the voters' voters' view of what's important is different from our view, and that's, for example, we also see in healthcare. One of the I, I didn't mention it, but in healthcare, one of the striking facts is how little of the government healthcare system in rural India gets used. Uh, Eighty percent of visits are to uh, non, um, you know, non-government providers uh, from national surveys, and out of those visits, about 80 percent are to people who go to pri private providers, I'll go to private providers who have no medical degrees. And nonetheless, people go. Why? Well, again, the government healthcare system, for example, I mean, it does many things, good and bad, but one of the things it does is says, look, we, we're not just going to give you uh, steroids and antibiotics at will. There are, should be limits to that. And so when I talk to the nurses, uh, on the, uh, they, they will tell you that, look, I, don't, I can't prescribe what I would like to prescribe, and therefore people don't want to come to me. And some of them even say that, look, I secretly go privately buy some medicine so I can prescribe them uh, the medicines that are, I'm not supposed to prescribe. So, and again, that's an example of something of a failure by design. We want uh, a, a certain kind of healthcare system. Uh, the healthcare system is a care system where people give, um, you know, the right medicines, that's the, maybe the right objective, but that of course comes with the uh, tension that the people who um, value some other form of healthcare, let's say they want to get uh, steroids, are not going to like that healthcare. So I think that that's another example of where the vo what voters want and what we want them to want or what I want them to want are different. And therefore sometimes when I call something a failure, I'm just e expressing my own prejudices. So. I think those are important caveats. But with that, I want to spend the last few minutes um, talking about uh, what are different, um, what do we know about the sources of democratic failure? Why doesn't the, given the competitiveness, why don't we get better outcomes? So one of the things, uh, here's a fact that uh, is striking, um, which is that between 1990, uh, 1980 and 1996 in UP, uh, there was a, a massive change in the correlation of the underlying population. So what fraction of it is, is, um, is uh, upper caste and support for upper caste parties or non-lower caste parties. So the correlation was basically in 1980, there was no correlation. And in 1996, it's because hugely correlated. You know this story. You know that what happens in UP is that there's a rise of a particular uh, caste parties. Now, I, I don't, I, again, I don't want to, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that was a bad thing. I think there was a lot of, you know, in the 1969 UP uh, administration, there was no lower caste uh, person in the m entire ministry. So, that, I mean, the, the forces that generate these responses are previous, previous pieces of history that you may, uh, blame exposed, but w things that happen. So I, do, I don't want to say that this was a good thing or a bad thing. But what it does, we show, uh, is that it, it leads to, uh, if you look at the change in uh, between 1980 and 1996, it changes, it takes, uh, what it, the shape it takes, it is the shape of a, a tolerance of people from your own caste. And this was both true in the upper caste dominated areas and the lower caste dominated areas, equally true actually. Uh, I'll show you the graph in a minute. Of people who are corrupt, but they're apna corrupt. You, you know, 
Uh, so they, it, it turned it into the whole, uh, what happened during this period was that there was a, and I'll show you the, the next, yeah, sorry. That's the graph. That graph is basically corruption and what's on the horizontal axis is the fraction of uh, people from, you know, you can think of it as the lower caste share. The, as the lower caste share goes up, the winners from lower caste get worse and worse. And when the upper caste share goes up, the wi upper, uh, winners from upper caste parties get worse and worse. The more dominant you are, the worse the legislators you elect. So the, uh, it, so it's ve very clear and the effect is very large. Where, where the, the two groups are roughly equal sized, you actually see very little change between 1980 and 1996. All the change is where either one group is dominant or the other group is dominant. They're the winners tend, turn out to be people who are extremely, um, you know, who ha about whom you could say many, many things, many criminality, for example. The, who are the criminal winners? They, are, they tend to be, you know, upper caste people in upper caste dominated constituencies and lower caste people in lower caste dominated constituencies. It's the extremes where all the change happens. And that's a striking fact about what uh, ethnocentrism does. Let me, now, again, the question is why is there ethnocentrism? And I think there are two answers to that. I want to em emphasize. Uh, I mean, one answer is that this is, this is how we are. Now, an alternative answer is that actually, you know, if I have no idea of any of these people are, then why not vote with the person who has the same name as me? Uh, you know, a kind of a in, an ethnocentrism of indifference, where you are ethnocentric because you really have no stake in the political so you, you All of these people, and I, I had to, I um, actually made a documentary about uh, uh, about elections in India, and one of these wonderful characters in the document is a woman who says, you know, uh, I, so I actually ask her, you know, would you vote based on caste? And she says, yeah, why not? I mean, everybody else, I mean, nobody from my caste ever comes, so I never get to vote for them. If I ever got somebody from my caste to come, maybe I will vote for them. So I mean, it was very, it was, she was very upfront about it, because in a sense, and I, do, I think it was partly comes out of this general sense that you know, the system doesn't deliver much to me in any case. Why don't I just vote based on something that's sort of, you know, it's, he has the same name as me, or at least I, I sort of recognize the name. So a lot of, so, and why do I believe that that's part of the, at the part of the story? Well, we did an experiment where, I, I'll tell you, where we did uh, puppet shows and, uh, you know, gen uh, and, or, and they were in, about a few hundred villages. Uh, in each village, we organized a puppet show and a program. Uh, and the message was, n don't vote, vote on caste. Vote on whatever uh, economic uh, issues that are m meaningful to you. That was the message. So the message was politically neutral. It was delivered by an NGO, and it was politically neutral. It didn't say vote for this party or that party. It was voting for, it says vote, don't vote based on caste. Vote based on you know, wh who you think will benefit you. So when we did that, we see very substantial effects on uh, voting by caste, about a 10% reduction in voting for your own caste party. So we see uh, large effects of that, suggesting that people, and this, our message wasn't that deep, or it, we didn't give them any facts. We just told them, don't do it. Just think about it once. So it was, n it was not a message that was about, you know, here are uh, 27 reasons, here are facts against this legislator, don't vote for him. We gave them no information. In fact, politically, it would have been deadly to give any information. This is in UP elections. You, you go out saying, you know, I, I'm going to give a, you know, name information against individuals, you, you, you can get into lots of trouble. So we were precisely committed to giving no information, but no information still got people swayed. Why? Because to be honest, they were voting less out of any particular commitment to any caste politics than to indifference again. And when you're indifferent, then any message which appeals to you, a nice puppet show can actually sway, sway you. And we see that, we see a 10% reduction in your own caste voting. I'll skip the slide. Uh, now, continuing on along that line, uh, you, there is a, so one of the things, so 
part of what I'm suggesting is people often vote based on caste because they don't have any other better reason to vote. And why don't they have a better reason to vote? Partly because they have no idea of what the legislators do. Uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we, uh, so d we did an ex another of these experiments, about 200 constituencies in con two, 200 uh, slums in, in Delhi, where we, um, first thing we did is we asked what, what do you, you know, what do you know about the le legislators? Um, and th then we worked with, uh, with Dainik Hindustan to publish report cards randomly on randomly chosen constituencies. And we compare constituencies where the report card was published where, with ones where the report card was not published. And we see that uh, that generates quite substantial swing in the votes. When you give out report cards on the, cons on the legislators, people actually, uh, you know, clearly change their mind about, uh, about, about, these, le about these legislators. Uh, they, and the information we give them is, is not particularly subtle. It's just a publicly available information about did he attend the committee meetings? Did he, how did he, did he, how he spent his uh, MLA, MLA lads fund? How did he spend it? Did he spend it on, and it turns out that, uh, you know, that information was lots of people, uh, didn't really have that information, and when you provide that information, they change their vote. So again, very consistent view with the view that a lot of our democratic failure comes from the fact that people actually, you know, if you don't know what performance is, for, and that's, a, in a sense, I want to argue, uh, I'll argue at the end, that that's in a sense a built-in feature of uh, the nature of our democratic state, and so it's, some, it's something we should th need to think about. I'll come back to that point. Uh, right at the end, before I, in closing, um, so the I'm going to skip that, and if I can. Um, so, continuing in this story, then so after this happened, we decided fine, we'll tell the legislators. We now know that if we give out information about how they performed, votes change. So we're going to tell them. And uh, so we did this again in Delhi during um, one of the, um, the municipal elections. And we told them, look, we're going to give out, uh, give out information about your performance. Um, this is the format. It's not, it's not private information, it's public information, information that's available from, from the, you know, the MLA lads and the, all of these fund spending is public, public information, you can get it. Uh, so I'm going to give out this public information, and with this public information, uh, you can, um, so we told some of them that, look, we're going to publish a report card about you. And the others, we told them, we are no, you are, you've been, the lottery has chosen, and you, there will be no uh, report card about you just before the election. And we won, we did this two years before the election, we told them this is going to happen in two years. So we gave them a two-year window <coughs> to change, you know, if they wanted to change their performance, to change their performance. And you see that, well, first thing, uh, I think the striking, uh, start with the striking fact. The striking fact is that most of their spending from their lads' funds are, are not on things that people want. So 54% of the spending, of the councillor spending was on roads, and lanes, and 2% of the uh, respondents said that's what they need. Um, whereas what they really, uh, you know, 69% I think say they need sewage, and 16% uh, of the spending. So a lot of the spending is on things that, for whatever reason, they, the, the councillor thinks are important, but voters and councillors have very different views. Now, if you, if you tell the councillor that the report will come out, the councillor changes his behavior. It changes the behavior substantially in the sense that the, uh, the spending on sewage uh, and drainage, which is, uh, goes up, the, the spending on parks and greenery, which is not important to the voters, goes down. Spending on roads goes down. Now, these effects are very large proportionally, but since more, very little of the spending is happening on drainage, of course, the, you know, the consequences are not massive, but still, 
proportionally very large effects on those things. So that's for point number one. Point number two is that the electoral system responded to it. So when the report cards were given out, people who had good report cards were much more likely to rerun. The, otherwise, the parties dropped those people. People who had bad report cards were dropped by their own parties. And they became, so the, so the system, once the information is there, the system actually uses that information. The parties dropped those. And in fact, people with report cards in the bottom half of report cards, if they were, so part of a, a small nuance is that a lot of the report cards are, so a lot of the legislators could not run in their own constituencies because of, uh, of, um, of the reservations. And in particular, there was a massive increase in reservations. They couldn't run in. So among the people who couldn't run in their, cons their own constituency, if your report card was below median, the party just dropped you. If you're above median, you got to run somewhere else. So there was actually very large turnover as a result of this. Uh, and it, the report card mattered a lot. So the political system, in some sense, is willing to use the information. But the information is, uh, and as a result, you see uh, you know, uh, changes in the composition of the legislators. I, I'm going to, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it because uh, you know, another set of slides. And we find this in Rajasthan. We did this in, with panchayat elections. And again, giving people some information or encouraging people to use information uh, changes who participates in elections as well. So in panchayat elections, the you, the, you file nominations just before the elections. We did an experiment across a few hundred villages where we did puppet shows saying, you know, you should pay attention to, you know, spending on, on uh, NRAG and things like that. And you, when you do that, you see, uh, again, a substantial change in uh, who runs for elections. Uh, sort of the in incumbents drop out and the outsiders step in. So the system is responsive to information. The challenge, and this is, uh, I sort of want to, um, this is sort of the main, uh, is how, how, what, how can you, well, there are two challenges. One is, you know, uh, even though we did manage to shift people's votes and uh, we did manage to get uh, get uh, performance to change, the effects are small. The effects are small uh, because, well, partly because uh, we started with being very far away from what the voters wanted and we got a little closer but not very, very much closer. Now, you're, but, part of the, but the, part of the challenge is deeper. The reason why it's deeper is think about the size of our constituencies. So think about parliamentary constituencies. We have uh, 540 seats in the Lok Sabha. The UK has 650 seats in, the, in their equivalent. We have a population that's 20 times that of the UK. So, you know, so think about what that means. We have roughly 24 times as large. Our constituencies are 24 times as large. Now, if you think about the, and, and that, Scaling, if you think of local governments in the UK, local governments in the UK, the, the constituencies are, again, proportionally so much smaller. If you think of, uh, you know, West Bengal. Uh, West Bengal has 280 seats in the legislature, and it has a population twice that of, of the UK. You know, so, so in every stage, our, our constituencies are very, very large. What does very large mean? It means very hard to have information that's ever relevant to you. Because almost a nothing that the legislator can do can ever really touch you. There's so many people in the constituency that whatever he does, other than very big uh, policy making, so therefore the leaders on the ground matter very little for any individual. And that's not, that's a sort of a structural problem in our democracy. We are such a huge country that we, and at this point, you, you know, our states are so large that we don't really have uh, a, a direct mechanism for rewarding uh, uh, 
legislators because they are all, you know, whatever they do, they're going to only affect a small part of the population. Now we can publish report cards and those report cards will, you know, at least give out the information that they have done something. So maybe you find out that, you know, he didn't do anything in my neighborhood, but he did something else, uh, something in somebody else's neighborhood, and that's maybe good news. But all of that, all of those are very weak mechanisms. So that's, I think, par problem number one. And problem number two is that once you're in that setting where you really don't see, see very much of what's going on, and it's, even if you, you know, even if we, uh, if these people, we give out all the information, it's still going to be information mostly that's not about you. You would not have experienced it. And given that, it's very easy to be indifferent to the whole thing. And I think we have a problem, and once you have indifference, indifference feeds on itself. Because in some sense, if the legislator knows that you are going to not care very much about it, then he figures that, look, I'm going to come at election time, I'm going to do a, a dhamaka, I'm going to give out some money, I'm going to give out alcohol, all of these things happen. And, and then that's all that I need to do. Because in a sense, people are never going, whatever else I do is not going to matter. So I think we have a fundamental problem at the design of our democracy, which is that we have our, our I mean, our states um, are way too large. We, we need to somehow, if we really want democracy to work, in some sense we need smaller units. I mean, think about this, this number where, you know, we have 20 times larger seats in for parliament than the UK. That's a number that should sort of then fits with the rest of the story. Everything's too far away. And I think that, th so let me leave you with that thought. So I, I think that if I, there are of course many challenges for our democracy and I, as I said, in many ways we do very well. That's my starting point, that we do very well. We, we do have an involved population who goes to vote, who, you know, elections are competitive. But at some level we really are dealing with a, st a structural problem that we need to think about. I don't know what form we're going to think about. For example, we, under the, uh, the Panchayati Raj uh, system, there, was, uh, uh, there are district panchayats. They're just totally not used. N nothing goes to the district panchayats. And that's something to think about, uh, you know, the why, or why the distribution of power is where it is, is something, I mean, it's partly because no doubt the states would hate the idea that they're going to, all the power will be taken away from them and given to district, district governments. I mean, you can see why uh, the, uh, the urban version of Panchayati Raj was never implemented. So I, th I think we have a, I think the, the general thought I want to leave you with is that I think, and f for, a, uh, for a community of, especially of legal scholars I think, and lawyers, I think it's, a, it's an interesting thought. How does one change, in some sense, the, the distribution of power within the system, within the, and I don't mean by, by informal power, I mean formal power within the system, so that democracy can actually function better on the ground. So I, I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Banerjee. May I now request Justice Mirul to come and give an address. I'm a little disappointed that the, that the location of the lectern was changed. Otherwise, I was hoping, hoping that you would have uh, managed to see the right side of me. <laughs> well, you've just, be, you've just heard the, the right side of the, the argument on, on democracy, although I have a few reflections which I would make bold to express in the presence of uh, Professor Banerjee. But before that, uh, I must tell you that it's a, it's a, it's a great honor for me to be here because I remember Sunanda Bhandare more as a young boy uh, 
tagging along with my with my parents and uh, i remember the time when uh, uh, sunanda and murli bandare visited my nana's house in jaipur and stayed with us and i believe that was sometime in the in the late 70s and uh, times have passed but i will begin by i will begin by uh, talking about very briefly about the subject uh, on which professor banerji spoke today uh, democracy and whether it has worked on the ground and what needs to be done to make changes and like i said i have a few reflections uh, to his uh, thought provoking and insightful uh, address the first of all being that i am not so certain whether performance of a particular candidate is a key factor in getting reelected and i'll give you an example and an example by itself may not uh, may not fit the bill but uh, if i remember correctly uh, a uh, former prime minister dr manmohan singh contested a lok sabha election from the south delhi constituency in delhi south delhi is uh, admittedly one of the most prosperous areas in delhi and is inhabited by people who benefited the most from the opening up of the economy by the narasimha rao government he all but lost his deposit so that's the one thing i think we need to factor into what is uh, what will change uh, things on the ground the the other thing that we we need to consider is that professor banerji spoke about smaller constituencies in terms of people uh but i am i am uh, i am a little uh, ashamed to tell you that i read a report which says that some of the smaller states in india in the northeast where population is sparse compared to other parts of india anybody intending to contest an election for the post of an mla needs a war chest of uh, approximately 50 crores so those are the realities of our of our democracy the reason why i begin with this is uh, i have always believed that uh, democracy our democracy in particular should be directed at uh, the two principal crimes that we inflict on our people that is uh, and they are of course interlinked hunger and poverty right and i believe that any system that does not alleviate people's uh, hunger and their poverty will will not uh, will not work and cannot be countenanced well this was on the on the on the subject of uh, today's memorial lecture but i think i will go back to what i originally intended to speak about which is uh, justice sunanda bandare and i will call her sunanda bandare because she was a lot more than just a judge and uh, she was somebody who inspired an entire generation of not just uh, lady judges or women lawyers she inspired all of us is somebody who has been very appositely described as freedom's child she was born in the year of the quit india movement and when i see maushi sitting here who reminds me she is a she is an image of uh, sunanda bandare uh, when i joined the bar in 1986 uh, and i strike a very personal lot because i believe those whom the gods love die young my father passed away in 1984 at the uh, ripe young age of 
and Justice Sunanda Bandare passed away at the at the age of 52. And when I joined the bar, and uh, in those days, I was not truly attached, or I wasn't deviling or an understudy with a senior. We would just walk into courtrooms that were normally referred to as interesting, where something or the other was always happening. And uh, Justice Sunanda Bandare's courtroom was the ideal spot to be in. For the simple reason that she would hold forth uh, and uphold, uh, uphold, uh, uphold economic and social justice and come down hard on discrimination and exploitation of any and every kind. Now, those are the values that uh, I've tried to inculcate both uh, as a member of the bar for long years and as a member of the, of the Delhi High Court Judiciary. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, interacting with uh, Justice Madan Lokur, a former judge of the Supreme Court, and uh, I sat with him for a long period of time as a, as a young judge. And I was petrified because I knew there would come a time when one day he would tell me without advance notice, after having heard a matter, that Siddharth dictate the order in open court. Uh, well, over a period of time, one loses the stage fright, but one remembers the lessons. Um, I, I won't take much time. The fact is that I was very close to Murli and Sonanda, and Murli was uh, a source of great inspiration uh, for me, a great support for me, when I started practice in 86 uh, before the Supreme Court, before I realized that uh, the, the Supreme Court is supreme, is right not because it's right, but because it's supreme. <laughs> so I, 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 I demoted myself to lower levels the, in the hierarchy, and I moved to the high court and the lower courts, and I'm glad that I did that. Uh, there are just two things that I would like to emphasize at a, as a, since we are talking about democracy, is that uh, uh, Allama Iqbal very famously said, ke jamuriyat ik tarz e hukumat hai jisme bandon ko gina karte hain, tola nahi karte. Yeah. The fact is that it's not just about the voters when we say ke bandon ko gina karte hain. It's also about the, about the contestants, about those who aspire to represent us in various bodies. We are completely uh, divorced from reality when it comes to electing our representatives. It's unfortunate because I would have thought that all those who aspire to serve the people would begin on the premise of Antyodhya, which is the, the rise of the last person, the, the lowest economic denominator. And it's this it's, it's precisely this where, where, where I believe that uh, the judiciary has a very important part to play because uh, law without politics, as Justice V. R. Krishna has said, law without politics is, uh, is blind and politics without law is deaf. So uh, we must bear in mind that uh, the judiciary as an institution is not just a sentinel to safeguard the fundamental rights of the people, but to ensure that there is socio-economic and political freedom in India and equality. Uh, I will conclude by saying that it, it's been a great honor to be here amongst all the eminent personalities, both on and off the desk. And, uh, uh, and I will conclude with, uh, with uh, another couplet from, uh, from Allama Iqbal, and this one is for Sunanda Bandare. And he said that uh, 
نرگس ہزاروں سال نرگس اپنی بے نوری پہ روتی ہے بڑی مشکل سے ہوتا ہے چمن میں دیدابر پیدا جے ہند اینڈ تھینک یو کوئنسیڈینٹلی نرگس واز آئیز فیوریٹ فلاور آئی وانٹ ٹو تھینک یو آل for coming for the 27th Sunanda Bhandare Foundation Lecture. Professor Banerjee has informed us of the fact on a lighter note that schools got it right, a report card is all that matters. <laughs> we come here every year and uh, Tisa, Nanya and I were unfortunate to not know our grandmother, but we come here every year and we get to know her from the memories that are shared here. So I want to thank you for sharing memories of our grandmother. Uh, I would lastly thank IIC for uh, organizing the lecture. Persons from the media, Barden Bench and Live Law, thank you so much. Thank you.